And Joel, I'm going to turn it over to you to go ahead and introduce Elka, who, if you'd like, Elka, you can go ahead and open up your slides. Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Joel Tickner. I'm a co-director of the Toxics Use Reduction Institute and a professor of environmental health at UMass Lowell. Um, so I've been working in this in global chemicals policy and um, alternatives assessment in green chemistry for 20 years. Um, some of you may remember back in 2005, we brought a group of Europeans over, actually it was 2003, and then we did a series of trainings around the European chemicals policy reach uh, with Andrew Fazy, who actually is in the background on this call, and we'll ask him to uh, come on later after Elka's presentation. But over the last five years, uh, my colleague Molly Jacobs and I and Pam from Turi um, uh, in the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production, a sister institute to Turi, have been working with the European Chemicals Agency or ECA on their substitution strategy. What's interesting is that the Tura program and Turi provide an amazing model for the type of support that businesses need to transition and adopt um, safer, more sustainable chemistries. And, and it's that pragmatism of the, the Tura program that is, is a great juxtaposition to the great visions of the European policy uh, agenda, which is much uh, stronger than the policy agenda here in the States. So through the work we were doing with the European Chemicals Agency and the European Commission, we were introduced to Elke Van Osbroek from the Perion, uh, Perion um, uh, team and her partner Hiram. And what we found in working with Elka, and we've engaged Elka in a number of projects um, over the last four years in, in um, and Hiram is uh, uh, forward looking, you know, really wanting to do the best they could do for uh, reducing toxic chemicals, but at the same time being incredibly pragmatic. And it's that pragmatism combined with a, a big vision of where we should be going that makes um, uh, Peyron so so uh, vital and so um, so impactful in, in the work they do. And we've been uh, in a series of conversations actually with practitioners around chemical substitution, toxics reduction in Europe, governments and consultants, NGOs and industry about setting up a network of Tory like centers around Europe and and uh, the, the uh, Peron team is, is so vital because they, they actually work closely with industry on their chemical management challenges. So Elka has a, a long history in uh, environmental consulting and working in industry in polymers primarily. And uh, she has a great presentation for all of us. And um, we have a ton to learn from her. And hopefully she can learn a lot from all of your challenges in toxics reduction and adopting uh, safer chemicals. So with that, um, Elka, thank you so much for doing this with us today. Thank you, Joel, for uh, this nice introduction. Um, to all, as um, um, Pamela said, my slides will become available uh, with also some handouts on there. So you will see those soon on the website. So first of all, good morning to you all. In this presentation, I will give you the EU perspective of alternatives assessment, um, how it fits into and is driven by the regulatory framework of REACH, but also how a proactive approach ahead of any regulatory scrutiny is even more effective. And my goal today is to inspire you uh, with our learnings here in the EU. Now, when you look back at the presentation later on, or you want to use information of it, please consider our disclaimer uh, when using the information. A little bit about myself. I'm Elke. I studied bioscience and environmental engineering. And my goal in life and work is to create a positive impact. Hence, I started my career in circular economy and more specifically in the waste and recycle industry. In 2001, I changed to Bayer, uh, the production of butyl rubber, where I took several positions from production to quality to technical marketing, where in 2006, they dropped reach on my desk, um, where I was first a bit uh, intimidated. I managed to have fun implementing it 
and decided to do this even more. And so I founded Athlon in 2009. Now, our first application for authorization we made in 2013. And in the meantime, we made about 20 of those. Um, we also made a study in partnership with other consultants uh, for the European Commission on the impact of authorization. And in those years, we also helped several companies in finding and implementing proactively better alternatives. So in 2009, as I said, I founded uh, a payroll team um, and I was lucky enough to do this together with a great team, Hiram, Catherine, Tina and myself, and all of them are still there. And we, sh we share the same passion to drive improvement together with our clients. Today we are 15 and we're looking for strong additions still, so feel free to contact us. We have people from everywhere around the world that are welcome. So um, if you want to join, let me know. Now, our strength is to have complementary skills within our team while sharing, obviously, that same passion for improvement. So it's a patron's ambition to take a leading role in driving the transition, creating a positive impact. We start with... Was that a question? No, apparently not. Um, we start with helping companies to use their products safely. And from there, we guide them uh, to sustainable future-proof business operations. We do this by stepping up from a linear in a circle to, a, to an intrinsically circular business model. We are excited about the ongoing positive trends towards a circular economy. However, we find that the current efforts are placing straight lines in a circle while missing out on the holistic view. Straight lines in a circle creates an optimization of the parts only, but not an optimization of the total system. It is still a zero sum game, meaning that some parties can take a leading and dominant role and this means that the amounts won by the dominant players equals the combined losses of the others. So it may be an improvement, but it is still not sustainable because those that lose out have no incentive to stay in the circle. So we need to go to an intrinsically circular model where no one is left behind. It's an optimization of the system and not just of the parts. And it means that the joint effort leads to a win per party that is greater than what they could have achieved alone. Now, an intrinsically circular system requires the guts to throw everything overboard as we know it. We need innovative ideas in economic models, in running a business, in chemistry, in marketing, in many aspects. Innovation and regulation definitely go hand in hand, and when it comes to reach, we're talking about regulation of chemicals. So how has reach been helping and can help it even more with a good review of the legal text in achieving the goal? Well, chemicals are everywhere and that's okay because they bring health and prosperity for society. Think for instance of a surfactant in in vitro diagnostics used to diagnose COVID or a solvent used in the production of a promising innovative cancer treatment, or UV filters in sunscreen to protect us from skin cancer. Adsorbing agents used in sanitary towels or tampons, polymers that make tents light and weather resistant in the mountains, or surface treatment that ensures that the balustrade uh, you have on your sixth floor apartment is robust and you don't fall through. So there are many examples where chemicals are really making our lives better and longer, but we need to maximally avoid the use of substances of very high concern or substances of concern for that matters. Now, Aperon works with front runners to conduct the alternatives assessment of existing and emerging disruptive technologies, because that's really what we need to change the system. And not having a substance of concern is the ideal scenario, definitely when we're thinking about recycle of products. 
Now, what we do is we assess our clients' port substance portfolio for improvement opportunities. And we identify where they can achieve the biggest impact with the available resources taking into account that not everything can be done at once. Uh, if we want to tackle the elephant at once, nothing is going to happen. So we want to look at where it matters most. And for that, Aperon developed a standard methodology um, with a priority setting for a proactive alternatives assessment. And this includes not just talks and risk, but also climate, circularity, and resource depletion. And this for the entire life cycle of the substance. Because if we don't look at the entire life cycle of the substance, we may well be shifting the risk of one spot to another spot up or downstream the supply chain, which would be a regrettable substitution. An example of this is some of the alternatives um, of chromium-6 go to chromium-3. And not all of that is bad, but in many cases, it uses chromium-3 sulfate, which is produced from sodium dichromate. So the start product is chromium-6. So we're simply shifting the risk upstream. And that's not what we should be doing. We really need to make this paradigm shift and look for a better solution. So when it comes to alternative assessment, I like to split it in two sorts of alternative assessment. You have on the one hand the reactive one, and on the other hand, the proactive one. And when we look at the reactive, I mean with that, the one that fits into a regulatory process. Um, it pushes all companies to improvement, whereas the proactive one, it fits into a voluntary effort and it typically works and is done by the front runners while the others are lagging behind. Now, the downfall of a reactive one and what we see in the authorizations is that it is typically a negative assessment. We look at what has been done so far and explain why it has not been functioning. Obviously, we also describe what we're going to do in the future, but this can be more in depth still in the future, I would say. Whereas the proactive one, the company starts in time and is really open minded to look at really sustainable future. Uh, solutions. The reactive one, you have external scrutiny. The proactive one is an internal process. A big difference is time. When we look at the reactive one, companies start too late. They start when the substance is listed on the authorization list, and then they describe what didn't work so far, if they already did that, um, and they describe what they are going to do. But when it then comes to the scrutiny, they only receive the time that they need as a minimum. And this pushes them towards substitution, but in some cases towards a regrettable substitution. And I will come to that with my examples. Whereas the proactive one, they start well in time and they have the opportunity to, um, to look at the budgets that they have, spread it over the time and find the best possible sustainable solution. So if I make the comparison, I find that the proactive alternative assessment is more effective to find a sustainable substitution and to move to that. The problem is that only the front runners act. So to make a real difference, we need both. We need regulatory and voluntary actions. Now, let's look at what the alternative assessment uh, means under reach and how it is, where it comes from. So a little bit of background about reach, if you wouldn't know it. Um, so under reach, we have three main processes. We have the registration, which is the inventory of all the sheep with an assessment, whether they buy it or not. Uh, all manufacturers and importers of substances are required to assess the tox profile of the substance and to describe the conditions for which for using them safely. Um, as such, all the, the authorities know where the substances are being used and who places them on the market. So the inventory is there. The second process is the evaluation process. And there, the authorities assess whether the information is complete or not, and whether additional information 
needs to be provided. Definitely when it concerns substances where they have a potential concern already based on the data provided so far. So in the evaluation process, the black sheep are identified. And once these black sheep are known, it's all about risk management. And on the reach, this can be done either by a restriction, which is the isolation of the substance, or authorization, which is basically a ban in the long term or very long term uh, or midterm. Now, when do we talk about the black sheep? What is a substance of very high concern? Well, these are the, the carcinogenic substances, mutagenic and reprotoxic substances, category 1A or 1B, uh, the PBTs, uh, the VPVBs, and what is called on the reach equivalent concern, which are the endocrine disruptors, sensitizers, very mobile substances like PFAS, uh, and there will be others added. Now, you may know that uh, REACH is under review at the moment, and with the chemical strategy for sustainability, which is a part of the Green Deal, um, we will talk in the future about substances of concern instead of very high concern. So that means we will add more categories to the list. Now, very briefly about the risk management processes and the difference between the two. Restriction is basically uh, saying you are allowed to use a substance under restricted conditions. There are forbidden zones, like you cannot use phthalates in toys, for instance, that's a restriction, or you're limited to a certain percentage uh, in, in, in a mixture. Uh, that are examples of restrictions, whereas authorization, basically the use of the substance is forbidden unless an authorization has been granted under specific conditions. So I call them the islands of allowed use and it's time limited. You only get X time until you find a better substitute. Now, when a substance is added to the authorization list, it also receives a sunset date. And after this date, the use is no longer allowed, unless, as I said, uh, authorization has been requ requested, uh, timely, um, and granted. Now, if the substitution before the sunset date is not feasible, uh, a company has to apply for authorization. And in this authorization, the applicant shall demonstrate that the risks are properly controlled, which means minimized, and that research is ongoing to replace the substance or the technology by a better alternative. And this is all described in Article 55 of REACH, which describes the goals of authorization. Now, the first goal is handled in the Chemical Safety Report, the CSR. And in the CSR, we provide evidence that the exposure and emissions are indeed minimized. And if we can do even better, we also describe opportunities, how they will be reduced even further in the short term future. The second goal, the alternatives, is described in the analysis of alternatives. It's just a different term for alternative assessment. It's how we call it here at the side of the pond. And in the analysis of alternatives, we described the past R&D efforts to show that at least uh, we have been doing uh, a diligent job uh, as, um, as soon as we knew it was a substance of very high concern. And um, obviously, uh, we didn't find a better alternative yet, because otherwise we wouldn't apply for authorization. So we also described the opportunities for the future to find better solution. And this is basically a substitution plan that is foreseen in the dossier. Then the last element is also crucial, um, is a socioeconomic analysis. It's not described as such in the goals, but it's a major part of the dossier. In the socioeconomic analysis, we compared the benefits of using the substance compared to the stop of using the substance. And it's, a comparison between the impact on human health and the environment monetized versus the monetized impact to society if the use would be discontinued. 
And obviously in this presentation, I'm focusing on the analysis of alternatives. So in the CSR, we assess the exposure of workers and men via the environment, which is another term for the general population. So everybody that lives around the factory or worst case scenario, if it would still be present in an end product, uh, the consumer. Um, this, is, this information is combined with a dose response curve that is generated by ECA, and that leads to an assessment of the actual risk of the substance. And this is then multiplied by the number of people exposed and by the value of a life. When it concerns cancer, for instance, a fatal cancer has a number of 5 million euros. It means that uh, the willingness to pay not to get cancer is estimated at 5 million euros. Now, this approach is a standard approach here in Europe um, for human health, but also something similar exists for environmental effect. Now, in the analysis of alternatives, the applicant is then required to follow a preset methodology uh, of a detailed assessment of the alternatives. And it's this preset methodology that is useful under the regulation, but also under a proactive assessment because it really works actually. And it all starts with defining the key functional requirements of the substance for a specific use. Now, once we know what the key functional requirements are, we then start with looking within the company uh, at information why uh, this is really a necessity. Um, sometimes we find that uh, a company comes to us with specifications from a customer that have been there for ages. And then it's key to question why these specifications are there and whether they are still required. And are the specifications required for the entire line of products or maybe just for 5% and the rest can do with a little bit less quality. So that are the questions that we ask to the in-company expert. Without the company itself and the expertise of a company, one cannot make a good analysis of alternatives. What I mean with that is we are there as an external th third party to scrutinize what they tell us, but the information comes from them. As an outsider or an accredited party, for instance, cannot just make an alternative assessment like this without the input of the company itself. So this assessment of key functional requirements um, uh, is made as well at substance level as at the level of the end product. What does the substance do exactly in the process and what effect does it have on the performance of the end product? And it may sound easy, but it is not. It really needs a lot of questioning to get the right answers from, the, from um, the company and in the end to be able to think out of the box for better solutions. And when we look at the substance level, it leads us to the suppliers, existing and potentially new suppliers to find out whether they can help with better alternatives. At the site of the uh, end product and the performance, it leads us on the one hand to the customers and we often uh, came across the fact that the specifications that have been there for a long time were not that stringent as one, or should not be that stringent as one thought they had to be. Um, so there we could find uh, alternatives in some cases, but also by looking at competitors and what kind of processes they are using. Um, and obviously, aside from all of that information, we look at uh, the typical, our dear friend Google is always helpful as well, even if it's generic information. We do find inspiration there, but also databases like People Green, Marketplace, Chemical are of help. Um, and we go to uh, green chemistry conferences uh, often to get new ideas from totally different applications even. And aside from that, we have 
honestly, a network um, with like-minded, crazy people like ourselves. And we find that uh, to come to really out-of-the-box solutions, you really need collaboration because it's there where the magic happens. So when we then look at um, what comes out of this exercise, we actually come out with a long list of potential alternatives. And then we scrutinize them at four different criteria. The first one is risk. Is there a reduction of risk? If the answer is no, it's a, a potential alternative that we cannot immediately scratch off the list. The second um, uh, criterion is a technical feasibility. Um, currently, is it technically feasible today? But also, if not today, what needs to be done to make it technically feasible in the future? And technical feasibility is also translated in many cases to a monetary value in the sense that it, it may have a slightly uh, worse performance, but what does this mean in terms of selling the product? Can you not sell it anymore? Or do you have to reduce the price a little bit, but can still sell it? Um, so in that respect, you can, we cannot simply say, oh, it's not the same, it's not as good, it, the quality is not as high, and hence, therefore, we scratch out the list. That's not what we should do. We really should look at what does this mean in terms of potential sales. Um, then is it available? Is it patented? Uh, and if so, can we get, um, uh, can we pay for it and actually use it as well? And again, translation into a monetary value. And secondly, is there enough volume? Uh, an example that I will give about the flame retardant, there, uh, there was an alternative, but there wasn't enough volume on the market. So the authorization was provided until the volume was there to actually um, use it. And then last but not least, the economic feasibility. Um, there we look at whether the alternative is much more expensive or not in terms of raw material cost, operational cost, investment cost, revalidation cost, uh, which is typically important for safety aspects or pharmaceutical aspects, uh, but also the cost, as I said, of a performance that is a lot or slightly worse. All of this means that an analysis of alternatives or alternatives assessment uh, is always company and business dependent. It's not possible to make this as a total outsider uh, for somebody else. Um, then an important one on risk. Risk is not just about toxicity. Because what are we with a zero tox environment in Europe when we forget about climate, circularity, resource depletion? And sometimes these different goals of the European Green Deal are leading to conflicting actions. For instance, substituting Latin copper by bismuth leads to worse recycle uh, of the copper. The yields are, the, are, are simply uh, not that high with bismuth as with lead. So we have to take that into account before we substitute from lead to bismuth, for instance. Um, so that's why I call it a comparative risk assessment where all of these elements, tox, risk, client, circularity, and resource depletion are taken into account. And this from an entire life cycle perspective. As I said before, we want to avoid that we push the risk somewhere upstream or downstream the supply chain. As I uh, gave the example of chromium-6 uh, substitution by chromium-3, uh, but also the case of, of um, the replacement of, of uh, lead with bismuth is a very similar one because uh, the mining of bismuth generates a fivefold of lead waste. So why would we uh, substitute to bismuth if we know this ab about um, the mining of bismuth. So we have to be careful what we're doing and make the right choices. And in principle, REACH only looks at tox and risk 
and not at climate, circularity, resource depletion, and not to the entire life cycle. It's not in the current legal text. I'm sure and hopeful that this will change with uh, the review of the legal text by 2022. Uh, but in the meantime, it is being accepted as uh, argument when we make our authorization applications. And we definitely take it into account when we make our alternative assessments. Now, the methodology obliges the applicant to look at alternatives at all relevant levels. So not just drop-in alternatives, replacing trichloroethylene by a different solvent, for instance, but also looking at alternative technologies or alternative end products. Um, an example of that is, uh, do we need tin cans or can we use glass bottles and what are the effects of glass bottles, for instance? Uh, and then two, a little bit controversial ones, but that we always have to describe is relocation. Uh, as an alternative, because let's be honest, that's what companies will also look at when they have to act for regulatory reasons. They may look at relocation to uh, different places in the world. And also closure is an important one to assess. So this preset methodology of the authorization scheme results in what we called the applied for you scenario. And this is actually the wish scenario. As an applicant, as a company, you describe their authority. If you give me authorization, this is my development plan, my substitution plan, how to get to a better substitute. And I will make sure that the exposure and emission is minimized. That's the applied for you scenario. In contrast to that, we also have to describe the non new scenario, which is the scenario what a company will do if the authorization would be re refused. And in practice, this is the best of the unsuitable alternatives, or in other terms, for the company, the cheapest of the unsuitable alternatives. Uh, companies don't like that they have to think that way, because when they engage with us, they say, but you're going to make sure that we have the authorization but it's something we really have to consider in the strategy. What happens if you don't get the authorization? And this defines, actually, this exercise uh, is a really good exercise for the management of a company to define the future business strategy of the company. So what it means is that authorization in itself is not avoiding substitution. It's a plan towards substitution while, in the meantime, the company is minimizing emissions and exposure, and not just to workers, but also to the general population. So then I come to what we can learn from these example cases. But I want to ask, is anybody having a question in the meantime? Pamela, you have to help me because I'm focusing on the presentation and not on the hands. So if there is any, uh, just uh, let me know. I'm going to wait a second. Elke, yeah, there's a couple of questions um, that this is a great time to stop and ask. Um, John asks, would you consider the new, the new OECD guidance for alternatives assessments to be reactive or proactive? And how does that approach compare to it? How does your approach compare to it? Uh, I think it definitely goes hand in hand and it, it goes much more into the combination of the two. Uh, but the fact that it's regulatory driven is always is, it will always have this reactive element into it, but the authorities are, are definitely uh, moving towards more um, uh, stimulation of the proactive uh, attitude, I would say. Great, thank you. Um, Edwin asks, have um, PFAS compounds been evaluated? And if yes, um, why is it taken so long to identify them as an issue? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and a very hot topic. Well, um, there is a good example of proactive and reactive. The REACH regulation in itself 
actually didn't cover substances like PFAS because under authorization only PBTs and VPVBs were covered. Uh, persistent bioaccumulative and toxic and very persistent, very bioaccumulative substances, whereas PFAS are PMT, persistent, mobile and toxic, and very persistent and very mobile. And I think it has been kind of an aha erlebnis that this was not considered in the legal text and should be considered in the legal text for future references. So that's, I think, part of why it took so long, definitely here in Europe, uh, where he has the problem of PFAS, we all know, is, is an issue that has been there for a long time, similarly to chromium-6. Um, so uh, thinking out, out loud here, what REACH has been doing over the past 10 years, it has been speeding up activities activity significantly, but not significantly enough yet. And we see an enormous change with the European Green Deal and all the efforts that are ongoing. Um, I've never seen this speed before and how things are changing. So I think we're in for a rise here in Europe. And as a result, probably also elsewhere in the world. That's one of the reasons why we're so happy to have you here is to, you know, to kind of give us that heads up about what's happening. So that's interesting. Yeah. Um, Michelle, if I may add to that, yes. I think it also created the awareness of companies to take that proactive attitude much more. And we really see that happening now where PFAS, and we all know the nice movie, uh, Dark Waters, uh, where um, it is concluded that companies were not taking the right actions. Uh, I think they start to realize that this is passé. We cannot act like that anymore. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, Michelle notes that you talk about how important collaboration is, and she's wondering if COVID has affected your ability to collaborate. <laughs> um, no. Um, uh, in our team, we all already were used to uh, working from a distance with each other, so that was not new. Uh, although we did come together very often and we haven't seen each other in half a year, I would say, uh, and then only a little bit even. Uh, but uh, we're currently experimenting with VR technology. Um, everybody in our team has a VR goggle. And we make brainstorms via the VR goggles to collaborate. So, and that's also what we want to do with clients uh, to avoid traveling and, and having to fly over. So for us, it has been a change, um, but not that big. And it drove us even further in finding better solution for collaboration. Fascinating, yeah. Um, and then Mike asks, has the EU addressed pharmaceuticals and endocrine disruptors? Uh, yes. Uh, however, this is more into the pharmaceutical, well, the APIs itself are covered not under REACH, but under uh, regulations specifically for pharmaceuticals. So I haven't covered that in my presentation. Uh, but it's definitely under investigation and there is uh, an enormous collaboration at that, this moment between ECA and EMA. EMA is for the uh, medical um, applications and, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, so yes, it is, it is being uh, uh, assessed. That's great. Thanks, Elka. That's all we have. So. Okay. Pamela, just shout when there are questions and I need to... And, you want me to take a break there? I will, but that was perfect timing, so okay. thanks. Okay, so what can we learn from some of the example cases? As I said, we did many, but I, I took out a few interesting ones uh, for sure. So the first one is HBCDD, which is a very well-known flame retardant used in uh, extended polystyrene and XPS. Uh, it's a PBT. Uh, it has been regulated under the POPs Convention in 2013, and it has been included into the authorization list 
since 2009. It was one of the first substances on the authorization list with a sunset date of 2015. Now, when I look at the scheme that I presented to you, that's what I will do with all the, the cases. I will use the scheme as we make our assessments. Of course, this is a little bit uh, simplified to what we do in real life, but that are the basics. So a drop-in alternative for the flame retardant uh, is a polymeric uh, brominated flame retardant. Um, alternative technology was also assessed. Uh, a large number of, uh, of sites uh, are there and in operation. So going to a totally different technology to make EPS uh, would have been much longer uh, in terms of substitution, uh, problems with the life cycle of the installation, which was of course long, so hence an extremely expensive alternative in comparison to a drop-in alternative. When we then looked at alternative end products like glass fiber, for instance, uh, the life cycle analysis indicated that there was also a risk compared to the glass fiber, uh, which was greater than moving to the polymeric uh, flame retardant. Um, relocation was assessed uh, outside of the EU, but was for sure not a viable solution as well uh, from a climate perspective, perspective as an economic perspective. Transporting uh, very low density material is uh, a little bit insane to do, so that was not chosen. And closure uh, was also not an option um, in terms of uh, comparison to, uh, to applying for authorization. So here, uh, the companies decided for a drop-in alternative. Now, how did they come to this drop-in alternative? It was actually a joint effort between as well, on the one hand, suppliers of HPCDD, and on the other hand, the producers of EPS. And they started their research already in 2003, so long before the POPs convention and definitely long before um, the authorization listing, uh, purely based on the in inherent properties of the substance, they decided to look at a better alternative. Now, before I get the question, you can question whether it is better when it's still prominated. Uh, assessments have been made. The conclusion was that it was better. Uh, obviously, um, I think things like that are always to be reviewed also after a period of time. Now, because there wasn't enough volume on the market by the suppliers, uh, uh, before the sunset date, they had to apply for authorization. Uh, they requested two years, which is the minimum ever requested, but that's the time they needed before there was enough volume. And obviously the request was accepted. Uh, and in the meantime, the substitution has been completed. Obviously, HPCDD is no longer being used here in Europe. So the learning from this case is that a joint effort between users and producers is actually really effective and an extremely good idea. And a proactive alternative assessment uh, was done purely based on in inherent properties and ahead of any regulatory requirement. And this is an effective way of working and we should definitely stimulate this way of working. The second example is trichloroethylene, a solvent uh, that is used by a company that makes batik textiles, uh, which is uh, used for ceremonies um, uh, in Africa. Uh, you see the colorful pictures here that, uh, that you know from uh, uh, the news, I would say. And to make this, uh, this, this uh, fabric, they use a resin on a cloth and to remove the resin, they use trichloroethylene. No other solvent so far had uh, the same properties to reduce all the resin, um, to um, remove all the resin, sorry. Um, so when we looked at their installation, which was taken well ahead of time, um, it was used into a closed box and the exposure levels were 
um, or the, the excess lifetime uh, risk was three into 100,000, so three cancer cases into 100,000 was the risk. And uh, once we passed and gave, her, gave them our IDs on, on um, engineering improvements they could make, which were economically also possible, we reduced the risk to four into one million, which is an enormous improvement. And then in terms of uh, exposure of the general population, so this is a picture of where the company is and we looked at where exposure could take place. Then we saw that at about one and a half kilometers from the factory, the concentration was already below, the concentration as a result of the emissions was below 10% of the normal background concentration of trichloroethylene. And uh, as close as 350 meters from the factory, the exposure or the risk levels were below four into 10 million, uh, where standardized, we look at uh, a maximum of, of four into 100,000. So um, they did very well, definitely after the improvements made on site. Now they also have to look and did look at potential alternatives. And there we looked at propane alternatives and on the list were all the nice ones like toluene and perk that we don't like to see happening. Uh, but after uh, Hiram and I went to a green chemistry um, conference, we came up with the idea of what is called a switchable solvent. So a totally new uh, innovative solvent. Um, now, alternative technologies, we also looked at alternative resins that didn't need perchloroethylene, alternative end products, like using printing techniques instead of batik. Um, by the way, they are still, or started to look at this again, because of course that technology improves as well, so that it's still under investigation. Uh, relocation was an option because the product is delivered in Africa, so they can as well work in Africa, uh, but that wasn't a, a viable option from an economic point of view and closure as well. So here in the end, the uh, wish scenario, so the, the applied for use scenario is a switch to uh, switchable solvent, which is the innovative and sustainable alternative. Whereas if they would have gone to PERC, it would have been clearly a regrettable substitution. Now, what is important here is that if the authorization would have been refused, or if they would have gotten only four to seven years, they would have moved to PERC because then they would not have had the time to invest in a better solution. So time is key. Um, now the ongoing R&D, because they got their 12 years, uh, in the meantime, they are continuing the R&D towards the switchable solvents and it, uh, it is looking good still under research, but uh, it is looking good. Um, but as I said, they also keep their minds open to other possibilities. So they don't just look at switchable solvents because potentially at some point in the research, it may fail. And they really want to substitute by um, 2028. That's when they have their end date. And hence, they're also looking at different technologies still. So they can stay open-minded towards the best possible solution for them and for society. Now, an important footnote I want to make it here is that alternative assessment by a downstream user is significantly different to alternative assessment by a manufacturer of a substance. Because a manufacturer typically develops drop-in alternatives, which they can supply as well, uh, the supplier of trichloroethylene provides also perchloroethylene or some of the other solvents, but they're not going to provide the alternative technologies of different printing techniques. So it means that there is a conflict of interest between the downstream user and the manufacturer um, because this manufacturer is not interested that the downstream user is 
would move to a different technology. So an alternative assessment by a manufacturer is, only lim is always limited to what he can provide. And for that reason, it creates significant uncertainties in a dossier when it's made by a manufacturer where on the one hand, the alternative assessment is limited, but also the information on exposure is aggregated in information and is limited. And as a result, they get shorter authorization periods, periods which is logic. But the end result is, and we see this massively happening at this moment, or has happened actually already over the past two years, is that the users, of trichloroethylene that were dependent on the authorization made by the supplier, they have all switched to perchloroethylene. And this is really very sad to see that happening. So we're learning here is that regulation is a good trigger for substitution, but substitution under time pressure leads to sub suboptimal substitution, or even in the very worst case scenario, to regrettable substitution. And here the example of the, the substitution that took place from trichloroethylene to perchloroethylene, simply because downstream users were not involved enough in the process of the alternative assessment. Third example, dichloroethylene used at Nurion, used to be at Sonobel, now it's Nurion, uh, quite a complex um, process. So they use dichloroethane as a solvent in the production of a surfactant. The surfactant is called uh, etapol 1000. Um, the dichloroethane is recycled in the process um, and the etapol itself, I will show it here. The, uh, excuse me for watching at a different uh, screen, but otherwise I cannot show it. Um, the etapol 1000 is a surfactant, which in itself is used to make uh, D-Cloud 45. D-Cloud 45 is a polyvinyl, polyvinyl alcohol, which is in terms used to make PVC. And PVC, we all know, is used to make uh, piping, cable insulation, blood bags, etc. So why is this actually important to stick to dichloroethane and why do we actually need this etapol 1000 or the D-Cloud 45 for all that matters? Well, the PVA is, a, is needed to make the PVC and that's beyond doubt, but why D-Cloud 45? Because if we wouldn't need D-Cloud 45, we wouldn't need dichloroethane. Well, the D-Cloud 45 is important because it has a unique position in the market that it doesn't require, it doesn't contain any methanol or ethanol. And it can be dosed easily in hot water of a PVC reactor. And for this reason, it has become key to US PVC manufacturers. That's why you see that 90% of it is uh, provided to the US. Um, and, and for the reason that they have to comply with the uh, methanol emission reduction under uh, metal emission reduction obligations under the US Clean Air Act. So here it has a climate aspect to use a toxic substance. That's where I said you sometimes have um, contra or conflicting interests between the different goals of the European Green Deal. So when we made the dossier and when we then made the socioeconomic analysis and looked at the balance of impacts, then we um, assessed, they had a really low exposure level, that the benefits of human health, if we would stop the use of dichloroethane, would come to 262 euros in nine years time. So it's, it's nine years leading to 262 euros in human health costs. Or in other terms, if we would stop the use of dichloroethane, there would be 0.0000168 uh, less cancer cases uh, per year. For avoidance of doubt, this is not a risk to get cancer. It means that per year, there would be 
less people dying from cancer, but at the order of magnitude uh, that I describe here. Compared to that, having to stop the production um, is uh, um, the invest. Well, the the cost of of stopping the production would come to, to almost three million euros. So you see that the benefits of continuing the use here are uh, outweighing the risks of continuing the use. And that's on, on that basis, we received the authorization. Now, importantly, here in this 3 million euro, we did not even take into account uh, the, the methanol emissions uh, if the cloud 45 would, not would no longer be on the market. So when we look at the alternatives here, we looked at drop-in alternative, uh, which was uh, cyclohexane was the, the, we looked at several, so obviously at the long list, but cyclohexane was the one with the highest potential for substitution um, that could be implemented in six years time. We looked at different technology, which was a water-based polymerization instead of uh, um, using cyclohexane. This was definitely innovative and sustainable, but uh, in the very uh, early stages of development when we applied for authorization, and it was considered that nine years would be needed to implement the alternative. We looked at different surfactants as well, the etapol 1000 as, as an alternative for the PVA, so alternatives for DCLAD45. Uh, we looked at relocation. They also had a site in Mexico uh, where they could relocate to, and if they would have not received the authorization, they would have done so because it was the cheapest non-suitable alternative. And we looked at closure of the business uh, uh, at a whole, where relocation was cheap, cheaper than, than closure. Now, a statement, I, I called them up the other day before I made this presentation, and a statement that um, the person that is in the lead of the alternatives uh, of the research uh, at Nurion, statement that he made was, if we would have received limited time, then we would have been forced to bet on the quickest horse. This would have been cyclohexane, which would have been the least sustainable solution, but they got the nine years. And as a result, they could take the risk to as well look at cyclohexane and at the same time continue the R&D for the innovative and sustainable alternative. Now, the great news here is that their own authorization is granted until 2026. But the development of the innovative water-based solution went much quicker than they had ever expected it could be and they are actually doing, at this moment, um, testing on, uh, on durability of the product. So the implementation at this moment is planned for 2022 already. So they are four years ahead uh, of what they received. And thanks to the fact that they received a long term, this is what they could do. So we're learning here is when sufficient time is granted, then targeted R&D can actually take place and can lead to innovative and sustainable alternatives. Okay, before we yes. move on to the next option, next example. Yes, we because I'm running out of time. I'm going to make it, maybe I skip a little bit at the end. No, 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 it's all good. We have a couple of questions um, about some of the examples you've just walked through, and this is all very interesting, so don't, okay. don't worry about that. Um, Jill asks if you could speak more to how you work to resolve conflicts of interest between manufacturer and end user. Uh, well, to be very honest, we, um, uh, we don't stimulate uh, authorization dossiers to be prepared by manufacturers or high in the supply chain. We do stimulate a collaboration uh, but our approach is a collaboration at the uh, level of the users with input of the suppliers. Uh, and we find this much more efficient in finding better alternatives. Great. Um, Liz asks if, um, 
what could you just explain a little bit more about what switchable solvents are? Are they ionic liquids? And, and how confident are we of their safety? Uh, well, that's a very good question indeed. Uh, in brief, I'm not going in the details of the switchable solvent. I can obviously send some information, but uh, um, it means that uh, they can be used at one spot in the installation, but then by either adding CO2 or in some cases ionically, uh, there are different kinds of switchable solvents. You can switch the properties of the solvent so that you don't have to use typically for pharma one solvent in spot A and another solvent in spot B, but you can simply add CO2 and it switches uh, hmm. properties and, and you can use the same one. Uh, and as such, you can also reduce the energy cost quite a bit. Um, that's in a nutshell what it is. How confident are we? Uh, when we started with, uh, it's, it's with uh, Jessup from um, uh, the Green Center in Canada, uh, we looked at uh, basic information on uh, the toxicity. Uh, we ran uh, some, some reader process as well, obviously, uh, to then in a further stage, look at actual testing as it is required on the breach. Great, thank you. Um, let's see, so Edwin asks, have you looked at oops, how the REACH assessments and recommendations have affected production or use of banned compounds in other parts of the world? <laughs> um, that's a difficult one. Um, we see different things happening. I don't know about an actual assessment made by somebody else, to be very honest. Um, but what we see definitely now with chromium-6, uh, and I will come to it in a moment, uh, a lot of companies here in Europe, especially the small ones, are actually closing down their business and moving them to other parts of the world. Uh, so we will see a growth elsewhere um, because then they can simply import the chromated uh, products into Europe without any issue. Uh, so that is taking place. So as long as uh, other um, continents are not taking the same measures, it will be an unlevel playing field for Europe, for sure. Uh, on the other hand, we also see a good collaboration between the authorities uh, and we see that actions that are being taken in Europe are also picked up in the US or in Korea or in China. Uh, so let's hope that will lead in the end to a more level playing field. So both are happening at the moment. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah. We, we will see in the future whether Europe is doing a good job in taking a leading role here or not. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I, I think there's no doubt that you're, they're doing a good job of taking a leading role. <laughs> yeah, but what this will mean for our company. Right, <laughs> right. absolutely. We don't know yet. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Lynn has a question and I'm gonna paraphrase a little. Um, do you see, is there a difference in the ability of, a, of an operation to get authorization if they're a smaller operation versus a really large operation? Does that come into play at all in the decision of ECA to, to, to authorize a use? Um, it depends on what you mean with an operator. Do you mean a, comp a big company versus a small company? Or do yes. You yeah. Yes. Um, no, I don't see a difference there on the con well, no. Um, even so, there have been extremely small companies uh, that decided even to work without a consultant uh, and where EGA has been working together with those companies um, to develop the, the arguments that they needed. So there, I think EGA is doing a great job in making sure that our small companies can also apply for authorization and get through. Uh, we have helped small companies, um, very small companies, with finding better alternatives. Uh, and, and they had a competitive benefit from that. So that works well for bigger companies. They have the resources. Right. Um, typically they have the money uh, and also a lot of resources on site. It 
requires a different way of collaboration, small or big, uh, but the chances to get the authorization are the same. This is different when we talk about applying as a single dance, as a single user, or as a group um, of, of users, uh, a, a small group similar to a single user. But when we're talking 20 companies, obviously information is being aggregated and this creates some additional uncertainty and hence they get shorter review periods. Interesting. Interesting. Thanks. Um, one last comment and then and then we'll go. Um, so Andrew, thank you for I mean, obviously you're doing a very comprehensive assessment for authorization um, going beyond what is required in reach. And his question is, are all authorization applications as thorough as yours? For example, the alternatives assessment. Um, I don't like bragging. But the answer is yes. I mean, um, no, they're not all at the same level. Uh, when I scrutinize dossiers that have been submitted, definitely when I'm talking the upstream applications or from the supplier and all the, 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 the supply chain to all the downstream users, it's not at the same level. It's not possible to do it at the same level. And when I'm totally honest, I find this kind of frustrating because it beats the purpose of reach. The philosophy is really creating improvement in terms of exposure and emissions and looking for better alternatives. And the upstream applications can intrinsically simply not do this. Mm -hmm. However, there is a problem for ECHA and for the commission that if all the users would submit separately, they would have a resource problem. So uh, we are there a little bit with a difficult balance on how to deal with it. Uh, but it's definitely comparing apples and oranges. Mm, thank you. Okay, well, that's all the questions for now. So if you want to continue, thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Okay, then we come to the last example, um, Chromium 6. As you know, uh, a large number of downstream users, um, a lot of different uses uh, for surface treatment. If you look at the pictures here, you have the decorative use for taps uh, in your kitchen and bathrooms. Um, we've got mills used in the printing industry. We've got um, highly performance um, uses in, in the uh, aerospace industry, tin cans, etc. So uh, a wide range of uses and clearly of key functional requirements. So automotive architecture, can making, etc, etc. The main concern is workers. Uh, why is that? Uh, because when it's released to the environment, it's quickly um, reduced to chromium tree um, and, and hence the risk for general population is actually low for uh, chromium-6. Now, when we look at the alternatives there, a drop-in alternative, the typical one is chromium tree. Uh, a lot of companies have moved or are moving to chromium tree uh, as we speak. And in some cases, I will come to that, this actually leads to no reduction of risk when we consider the entire life cycle of the substance. Um, alternative technologies, for instance, uh, for the decorative use uh, for taps, uh, PVD, uh, physical vapor uh, deposition is a typical one. Um, uh, we see it on the market even. It's more expensive uh, if you look at taps. Uh, the black ones or the, um, the golden ones are, or the PVD ones are more expensive and they're less performant. You will have more easily a scratch on your tap uh, when, when you remove some dirt. Alternative end products. Um, when we were looking at the tin cans, we also considered 
uh, uh, glass bottles, plastic packaging, aluminum packaging, and compare them to the tin cans. Um, we have not observed that uh, companies move to that for the specific reason that the tin cans were uh, for certain applications necessary and more performance in product safety. Relocation is a reality. It is simply happening. It has been reported. And uh, when we talk to users of Chromium 6, especially the small ones, we, uh, over the past week, we really received the answer from several ones that are closing down the business by 2024, or if the court case, which is ongoing, um, uh, would uh, remove the authorization, they simply stop earlier. Now, in terms of uh, Chromium 6, uh, the R&D has been ongoing for decades, and we already know for decades that chromium-6 is a really hazardous substance. Uh, as I said, several uses with many different alternatives. That's where the group dossier by the manufacturer went into the fold because they grouped uses without looking at the fact that one use had actually different alternatives and should have been different uses in the description. The alternative assessment made by the suppliers looks only at drop-in alternatives, so still chromium-based, so the chromium tree, because that's what they can deliver. Um, now, as I said, chromium tree still requires chromium-6 in the supply chain. We see a lot of use of chromium-3 sulfate, where this is made in Europe from sodium dichromate. So we're simply pushing it up the supply chain and it's simply not falling under authorization because it's the definition of an intermediate use and it's exempt. So this is a little bit bizarre that we simply push it somewhere else where it's exempt. Whereas the risk is the same. Uh, also when it's chromium-3, like chromium-3 nitrate, uh, not based on chromium-6, during the mining, you have still release of chromium-6. So are we really improving our world globally by moving to chromium-3? Not even speaking about the fact that most of the solutions with chromium-3 use uh, boric acid, which is a reprotoxic substance, which will come on the authorization list very soon as well, and which is very mobile and cannot be easily removed from water treatment systems. So in our uh, opinion, it's actually in most cases, not all, but in most cases, uh, regrettable substitution. And an innovative and sustainable alternative would be chromium free. But what we have seen is that companies spend millions with the very best intentions uh, to move to chromium tree as a result of the time pressure behind the authorization. And also as a result of the and decisiveness uh, at commission level uh, for this authorization case, unfortunately. So substitution is partially, partially achieved, but partially also regrettable. And then, as I said, what about the other substances? In these processes, they also use nickel. Nickel has the same properties of carcinogen category 1A or 1B, I don't know now, but one or the other. Uh, while also being reprotoxic. And it's not on the authorization list and they're using it in the same facility. And it's only workers exposure. So why not handling this as a whole? Borates, as I said, but also PFAS is being used in a lot of the installations that use chromium-6 to um, deposit the, um, uh, I can't find the word, the, um, I can't find the word, the droplets in the air. Um, and then an important question for me, and I have to watch the time a little bit, is was it actually all worth it? And this is, from my perspective, a more philosophical uh, aspect that we should consider in the future. Because what we have seen uh, in real life, and here I've taken the sum of three authorization cases we made because the information is confidential, so I aggregated it in three. And for all three uses, uh, authorization was granted for a specific time frame. And for all three, 
um, the time needed to implement a chosen alternative was provided. And construction is ongoing for all three. And together, they invested 190 million euros to move to an alternative, actually, chromium tree. Um, I expressed it here in uh, NPV, which is 161 uh, million euro. And against that um, is the benefit of stopping the use of chromium-6, which is 225,000 euros. This seems like an incredible choice uh, strategically from a management to invest so much money with such little benefit. This is not a normal business decision to take. Um, so here again, for avoidance of doubt, the 0.0056 are, uh, it's not a risk to get cancer, but it is the number of people less that could die from cancer. So what I wonder here is whether the 190 million euros from the applicants was actually money well spent for society when the benefit was only 20, well, about 200,000 euros. And what if we would spend this money in an alternative manner? And an example that I would like to give here is from a friend of mine that has a project in the desert of Africa. It's called Linea Verda and it's to make the desert green again. So they're really planting trees, but keeping them alive as well, um, to make the desert green again. And it's part of uh, the Great Green Wall project. Now, the project is led by Werner. And in 2010, they started with a reforestation project in Burkina Faso. And this is what it looked like. It was really a desert. Um, and it turned into a green and productive forest in only seven years time, which is the normal time frame to get an authorization. And for them, the important part is that the tree is worth more alive than that. So the 190 million euro brings them 300,000 hectares of trees, 1 million tons of CO2 per year uh, that we reduce, um, where 100,000 Belgians uh, would emit this um, amount. So that's also a, a great benefit. The return of investment from the cash crops itself is more than 5 million euros per year. From the grass is more than 3.8 million euros per year. And then there is the employment of 760,000 people and hence no longer a need to migrate to Europe or anywhere else in the world. So when I look at investing this 190 million euro into the Linea Verde project, then when we calculate all of the direct benefits, and I'm only talking direct benefits, this would lead to a benefit of 470 million euros. It sounds like a much better business strategy than the benefit of the 200,000 euros to substitute to chromium tree. And here I'm only talking about direct benefits, whereas there are clearly indirect benefits. Um, um, in Europe and for the rest of the world in terms of climate, migration stop, and um, maximally meeting the UN uh, SDG goals. So again, when I look at it, and if you were to ask me where I would spend my money, to the left-hand side, which is the alternative uh, to substitute uh, chromium-6 by chromium-3, or to make the desert green again, then I think I would know which choice that I would take. So the learning for me here is that regrettable substitutions are taking place in terms of overall risk. Again, chromium tree, in my opinion, was not the best solution, uh, but also in terms of societal consideration and meeting the UN goals in a better way with the resources that we have available. There are no unlimited resources in the world, so we have to use them wisely. So what I find is that we have to look at the priority setting of substitution. And first, those with a maximum positive impact for society. 
I'm not saying we don't have to substitute chromium-6, but I'm saying that maybe it wasn't wise to put it on the list as one of the first ones. So for me, substances that are not leading to exposure of the general population should not be the first priority. They still have to be on the list, but not as a first one. And while they are not the first one, we should still safeguard our um, general population by mitig mitigating the risk, which is easily done in case of a, a substance that is leading mainly to workers' exposure, because there we can use a binding uh, occupational exposure limit. So this leads me to the end. What can we conclude for companies outside of the EU or basically anywhere also inside the EU? Um, well, regulation does drive innovation. It is an important factor and thank God we've got reach and thank God is even being improved as we speak. We can also learn that a proactive alternative assessment is more effective than a reactive alternative assessment. And it's uh, an, an alternative assessment is multidimensional. We should not only look at tox, but also at climate, circularity, and resource depletion. Innovation requires time. If we do not give it enough time, it will lead to regrettable substitution instead of sustainable substitution. Innovation also requires the inside knowledge of the downstream user. When it's done only at the level of the manufacturer, it's far too limited. It shall consider the entire life cycle to avoid that the risk is shifted from one spot to another. And last but not least, we need a priority setting. We have limited resources, so we have to use them wisely to maximize on a, the positive impact for society. That's as far as my presentation goes, and I'm looking forward to more questions or a nice debate. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elke. Um, there is one question in the box, um, and maybe you can comment on it. Uh, in the United States, uh, the issue of environmental justice has become a big issue in thinking about facility siting and, and how waste is addressed. Um, is that on the regulatory agenda and thinking about alternatives or, or even siting in Europe? Uh, I don't know about the envir environmental justice you were talking about. If your question is mainly waste, mm -hmm. whether waste, okay. Well, um, when we talk about environmental justice, it's the idea that uh, facilities are often disproportionately cited in poor and, and um, uh, minority communities. And, and that that should be addressed in the regulatory framework that disproportionate impacts among some populations. Hmm. I'm thinking here, Joel, that's a tough one. I think it is, it is for sure included already now in the socioeconomic analysis. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking of a case of um, arsenic oxide, which was made for somewhere up north in Finland, where um, it was considered that if the company would have to close, what it would mean in terms of unemployment. And that is obviously different somewhere up north in Finland compared to uh, in, in the city of Antwerp, where all those people can much more easily find a different job. So we do consider that when we assess the impacts uh, for society. Mm -hmm. So that's for sure included. Um, when, we're, when you're talking about waste, um, the effects of waste are also included in the authorization scheme, even though waste as such is actually exempt from authorization it is an obligation to describe how the waste is going to be treated uh, and to ensure also that the emissions and exposures are minimized during uh, uh, the waste treatment itself. Great, thank you. Um, Andrew Fazy, I know you're, you may still be on the line if uh, you wanted to unmute and just add any 
last minute thoughts here where we're at really the end of our time, but uh, thought from a person who has been a European regulator, um, your perspective. We see you're unmuted, but we can't hear you, Andrew. I don't think it's gonna work. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, it seems like Andrew's mic is not working. Um, yeah. Um, well, uh, it, with Pam coming on, he says sorry, <laughs> sorry, Andrew. We'll we'll get your comments in another webinar. Um, it looks like you're gonna have to go into your box and hit unmute. I I just did that and it unmuted. So can you hear me now? We can now, Andrew. So okay, you thank you. I uh, thought to efficiently muted. Uh, so I haven't got my video on because I have had uh, quite a few connection problems. I'm afraid. So um, yeah, I think the I think it's uh, very interesting what Elka has uh, been talking about here. I mean, I think what is clear is what Elka is talking about is doing a very thorough, comprehensive, holistic assessment. And I think uh, what has perhaps been missing in Europe has actually been doing something as comprehensive and holistic as uh, she is describing. But I think uh, one of the uh, really interesting things is how quickly this system, the existing system works. And if you can see from what Elke is describing, it is a very costly and time consuming and exhaustive process. And again, yes, I think Elk is probably doing things uh, better than most other um, uh, authorization applications. And maybe what she is doing is, is the sort of a, a gold version, the gold standard, perhaps. But I think I agree with everything she's doing and what she is uh, saying. But what I uh, think the EU needs to find, and I think this comes out of the uh, new chemical strategy, is that we've got to find ways of doing things quicker and we've got to find, um, find people I think should be, um, there must be uh, uses and categories of substances or chemicals or products that aren't, um, aren't basically allowed to be used unless they can uh, really prove there's a need for them. And I think currently the hoops that people have to go through are very long and very exhaustive, but they don't serve the interest of trying to really reduce the burden on human health of the environment from some of these chemicals. So I think the balance isn't quite right. And I think this is recognizing Europe by the new chemical strategy. We've got things like the essential use concept, which to be honest, I'm not sure how far um, that has really been considered how it will work, but I think it's a recognition that we need to do things more effectively and more efficiently. And I think until we get to something which is, uh, frankly, more efficient, then we are going to continue to see an awful lot of problems uh, with chemicals. I mean, what worries me is the pace that things are done. And as Elka outlined, when you take the, the chromium uh, six example, it's taken up a massive amount of resources. And in the end, for what? I mean, there are, of course, some benefits, but there, as, I mean, again, I think um, um, Elka's example of greening the desert is a beautiful idea. But whether this could ever happen, people allocating their resources, something like that, is another matter. But I think it is certainly true that resources are and will continue to be, uh, in effect, wasted unless we find a more efficient way to do this. And I think the challenge for the EU regulator and globally is really trying to use the resources we've got the most effective and efficient way we can to try and really bring about meaningful replacement, substitution, call it what you will. And I think this involves, again, a very complicated process. We know about alternatives assessment, the problems of it. There's an awful lot of issues here that have to be resolved. And we have to do it in a regulatory 
sensible way so the decisions can be can be taken even there might be a few winners and losers in the process but to try and get far more chemicals and processes through the system and really try to make a difference in a more efficient and effective way but this is clearly a massive challenge and i i know elka and joel and others are thinking about this and certainly i am as well so this is a bit of a bit of a ramble but i hope of some interest thank you great thank you andrew and with that you know to to wrap up just to say um thank you elka for an amazingly thoughtful presentation um i think you know, over time, we've learned in Massachusetts about that challenge of depth versus balance and, and getting the right point of, of, of doing this in a way that it is effectively moves us towards um, safer, more sustainable chemistries. And, and that's not easy to balance that, 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 um, that, that the, the, the extent of the assessment with the regulatory needs. So, um, Thank you for giving us a practical view from Europe. And uh, Pam, I'll let you close us out. Thanks. Yeah. And, and my thanks as well, Elka. And I just want to wrap up um, by um, sharing one comment from one of our, our um, planners. So Joe says, excellent presentation. Lots of things to think about when we do our own assessments. And that is just a terrific outcome. So we thank you very much. This has been a really terrific 